Hello everyone, I thought some people might want to see all my deactivated guns in one video, so I'll go through them. The first one's going to be a replica. And before I start, because I know people are going to do it, these are all replica or deactivated guns, so none of them can fire. If there's ammunition inside the magazines, it's inert ammunition that can't fire. So there's no way I can shoot myself or anybody else in the video, there's nobody even in the house at the moment. Um, but I have to get it out of the way with because in all these videos, some people uh, it's not just one person, there'll always be people saying, you're going to kill somebody of that, you're waving it around, that's a gun. But no, these don't fire. Because sadly in Britain, uh, they don't like guns, the government. So you have to jump through a lot of hoops to own them and then they have to be sort of bolt action only in a sense. You know, you have to charge it for every shot if it's not in 22 or 22. So um, let's start. So this is a replica. It's a Griswold and Gunnison 1851 revolver, basically the Confederate copy of the Colt 1851. It's a muzzle loader, because back in the American Civil War, the majority of guns were muzzle loading. They were essentially muskets, but you know, a bit more high tech than normal muskets, so you know, going back through time. And this is a non firing replica, it's already got some rounds. Uh, essentially glued in so it looks like it's got stuff in. I think you can put caps on this, people have said, but I've never tried it. So basically, the Confederate version of the 1851 was a copy that was made not on license, um, and it had brass on it because it was cheaper to use to manufacture guns because the Union had much better logistics for big factories to churn out guns, as well as, you know, infinite conscripts to throw you um, as cannon fodder at the Confederacy. So this is a Denix replica. Lots of people say Denix replicas are really bad, but the old revolvers are absolutely fine. Uh, I think some of the coloration might be a bit off, but I wouldn't notice myself. You'd have to compare it to an actual revolver sitting next to it to see it. Um, I know on a lot of their newer sort of guns that you can't buy in the UK, sadly again anyway, because replicas after a certain date are banned for some reason. Um, but saying that, this it looks very realistic to me. It feels heavy, feels solidly put together. Single action, like the real one, so you have to pull the hammer back every time to pull the trigger and turn the cylinder. So there we go, Denix 1851 Confederate Grizzled and Gunnison sort of revolver. Very nice, does its job. Right, so we're going to do it timeline wise. So now we're going to jump straight to World War II, where I have the first of my deactivated guns. And apologies if some of these are a bit dusty, it's because normally I keep them sitting on my wall, and as I said, they're not going to fire again, so I don't take loads of pride in keeping them really well polished and oiled, because it sort of gets in the way of being able to do videos and, and handle them. So this is um, the Mark III small magazine or short magazine Lee Enfield. Uh, this is what my grandfather had in World War II, uh, the same sort of pattern of rifle, although I think he said he was issued a Mark IV later on. Um, it's bolt action. A very nice bolt on this, basically. You pull it back and you slap it forwards and you see that this bit moves to make it faster to do the bolt. So you can rack it off quite fast. The Enfields had a 10 round magazine in them, compared to many of the other guns of the time, um, which didn't have a removable magazine on the rifle. And it also held 10, which was good, rather than normal 5 or 6 on the bolt action rifle. The only thing was, um, apparently the soldiers weren't issued uh, with new magazines. They only had the magazine in there, so you had to use the clipper strips to, um, sort of, you know, the clips, stripper clips, to uh, feed the gun. And apparently uh, you were only issued 5 rounds on them, not the 10, so you had to use 2 clips to uh, fill the magazine up, or you could just thumb them in by hand, or take the magazine and thumb them in by hand. But anyway, this one is dated. If I can see the date, I think it was 1939, without me finding it. Well, I'm not going to be able to find it easily, am I? But yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a 1939 Lee Enfield, and I've looked before. I think all the serial numbers match on it, but that's not that important when they don't fire. And yeah, very good gun served in the British Army for ages, one of the most mass-produced guns in the world, and an all-round very good bolt-action rifle. Next, we have the Soviet PPSH submachine gun. Uh, this is very similar to a Sten gun, but it's what the Soviets made. 
and it's where the Soviets didn't have enough automatic weapons, they started mass producing these in factories. And then later in the war they made even cheaper, faster to produce versions of these, so they made several million submachine guns during World War II. They actually made too many uh, submachine guns that they were having to get rid of them en masse by the time of the Korean War because they, you know, were just oversaturated with submachine guns compared to rifles. So, basically it's an open bolt submachine gun. This one has a giant magazine on it that would hold 71 rounds, I think it is. But they also issued them with 30 or 32 round magazines, whatever it was, which are apparently more reliable. And the mag release on this isn't very good, which is one uh, bad thing about it. You have to really sort of prise the mag out, then slam it back in. Um, but probably using the logic of the Soviet Union, the soldier firing on these 71 round magazines probably wouldn't live long enough to reload it. So, yeah, it's very heavy for what it is, but that would help you control the recoil on it. Uh, on this deactivated one, I can move the trigger. Um, the select fire thing doesn't really move and the bolt's welded shut so you can release the magazine, you can pull the trigger, but that's it on this deactivated one and yeah, historically this was a very good submachine gun, it was logistically brilliant because of how many they built and you know, how robust it was, it was an open bolt design but you know, a bit better than the Sten gun in terms of quality control so that's PPSH 41 now, we have the M1 Carbine. This is one of my favourite guns of the Second World War. And this is very light compared to the others, if you can see. Um, this was essentially a paratrooper's rifle. Uh, they built it for anybody who was going to be not in a direct frontline combat role, or who needed a light weapon. And then, you know, the idea is that because it's a shortened sort of rifle round, rather than the pistol round, so it sort of sits somewhere in between the two, you could have greater range and accuracy than a sort of submachine gun, but um, it was also still lightweight and didn't take up loads of room. So, yeah, it's very lightweight, even with wooden furniture. And I know later versions of these, they stripped down a lot of the wood off and they had folding, like, metal skeleton stocks, which have made it even lighter. Um, in this one, I can remove the magazine. If I can find a switch. I think that's the safety. Yep, that's the safety. Yeah, so that's the magazine, you can see the little rounds in there, that's 30 carbine or carbine, and you'd just pull the bolt back, the bolt still works on this, which is nice, makes a very nice noise, um, and yeah, it has nice little sort of sights, but this was just in, sort of designed for either protection for tank crews, a lightweight paratrooper's rifle, or um, sort of, you know, for urban warfare. The M1 Garand was a much more powerful, longer range round, but this was very practical for, sort of, you know, it's, again, before we had proper assault rifles, this is sort of getting there, because it's a semi-automatic, and they did do fully automatic variants, you know, where you could have lower recoil gun for sort of spraying, but better than a submachine gun again. So, that's the M1 Carbine, that's one of my favourite guns, it's very nice, and it's a very lightweight for a World War II gun, you couldn't do that with an Enfield very easily. Now we have the famous bad guy gun, if you want to call it that. Uh, this is a Kalashnikov. It's not an AK-47 or an AKM. It's an RPK and it's a Yugoslavian one. You can see that's where the bipod would be, but it's been taken off. And it's got a folding stock. And this is a real gun, because I get a lot of comments, people saying this looks like it's built from a part kit. It's an M72 AB1, built by Zastava uh, Firearms uh, Manufacturer in Kragujevac, or however it's pronounced, in Yugoslavia. So basically, um, the M72 was the uh, Yugoslavian RPK, and the M72 AB1 was the RPK with the folding stock. Now if it's not rusted shut, I'll get that open. There we go. So, if you actually had it out, it'd be like this. And ergonomically, this isn't very good. It's very front heavy and light at the back because of the skeleton stock. Um, but it's an AK, so it's robust as hell. You can see this one's been through everything, which I quite like with an AK because they're very renowned for being reliable guns. Uh, you can take this one apart, but I'm not going to do it on this video because it's hard to put together because unlike a real AK, where it's been deactivated, some of the bits don't fit quite back in right once you've taken it apart, so then you have a lot of trouble getting the dust cover back on. But that does come apart. The 
30 round side magazines as normal with 762 by 39 millimeter. And yeah, overall AKs are very good guns. I mean, a lot of people don't like them, but they were good, uh, and they still are good. They're still serving, serving in lots of conflicts. The Russian army still has an updated AK-74 because they work well. Now, on to my favourite of all my rifles, and the one I know a lot of you like as well. Uh, the L1A1 SLR, which is the British built version of the FN FAL or FAL. Now, the FN FAL was the right arm of the free world. Prior to the Im introduction of M16s, this was the gun nearly every country in the West used against the communists. And it's a really well put together rifle. FN made them originally. And yes, they're a bit heavy. This is a plastic furniture one, so it's cutting out a bit of the light. And yes, it's a bit long, you know, and unwieldy, but they are very good guns. This, the idea was that you fired a full power cartridge. They're often referred to as battle rifles. So we go that 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO. And the idea was that you'd get a round that's similar in power to something like the Lee Enfields or any of the other bolt action rounds and make it into a semi-automatic rifle. Lengthwise it's pretty much the same as the Enfield, I'll be able to show you that. If you can see they're pretty much both identical in length, but this is a bit more practical than the Enfield because as I said it's 20 round magazine, so it's semi-automatic. Lots of fouls were automatic or semi, but it was hard to actually control it on fully automatic, obviously as you can imagine because it's a powerful cartridge. So what made this gun so good, uh, there's lots of features, but it had the cart charging handle or cocking handle on the left side. Shells would eject from there, but what this meant was that you could you know, change the magazine or keeping the gun on target, unlike still lots of modern rifles that don't have that feature. Um, and there's a gas selector just here, and what that meant is that you could, and I still see people complain about this online, which I really don't know why, um, but the gas selector basically means that you can adjust the gun's cycling power for whatever environment you're in. So if you're somewhere that's muddy and dusty, and you need the sort of piston to strike harder against, you know, the extractor and everything, um, people who are really good in firearms terms will be able to explain that better. When you've got the gas selector on high, you feel more recoil, but the gun cycles better. Whereas if it's nice and clean, and you know it's not muddy, you can have low humidity, whatever, you can put that to lower, you feel less recoil, but the gun still cycles. So you can adapt the gun for its environment without taking anything apart in it and fiddling about with a screwdriver inside. So, yeah, the SLR and the FAL was one of the best rifles ever built in history. Um, sadly, and this is a whole other subject, these got replaced by um, the more modern assault rifles, which are lighter weight. I know they're more ideal for urban warfare. It's a shorter range cartridge with lower recoil. Logistically, the soldiers can carry more ammo, but this, this does a lot more damage if you hit somebody with it, which was kind of the idea of a military rifle. You hit somebody once with this and they go down, because it's a big round. Um, Opening these up was very easy, you literally pull back here, the gun levers open, then I think you just literally pull out the internals from there to clean it, and then you can snap it back shut when you're ready. And to demonstrate that this is a well balanced gun, because a lot of people say it's not, if you hold it there, I'll just try and do it with that, you can see the gun pretty much has a centre of balance where the charging handle is. Obviously because mine's deactivated there's a, bit, a few bits cut out of there, so that would balance it back completely. But yeah, it's an easy gun to hold even despite its weight because it's well put together and well built. Sort of, you know, a relic of the past, but the SLR was one of the coolest rifles ever built. Right, anyway, that's my collection of deactivated firearms. As a few people have asked, am I getting any more anytime soon, especially with, you know, the laws, new laws coming in? Sadly not, because I'm probably getting redundancy quite soon, so I'll have to see how that plays out for how much money I've got to throw around, you know, throw around on deactivated guns. And also I like to, you know, wait and watch a lot of the sites to see when stuff's actually on, on good offer, because sometimes you can get good deactivated guns for about 150 quid. Other times some of them, you know, are over 500, so I normally sit around and watch and see when they're good, you know, offers on things. So, that's my collection. I don't have any deactivated pistols, maybe I'll look into getting those at some point. 
but obviously the problem is lots of iconic guns when they're deactivated are lots of money so things like an M1911 Browning high powers they're normally well over 700 quid which I wouldn't really see the point in spending on a deactivated gun because I'd rather in all honesty buy a really good air rifle or something for that money so anyway those are my, that's my collection and I hope you liked it.